found that what she saw from her out-of-body experience seemingly corresponded very accurately to what had actually occurred. She looked at the bone saw that was being used to cut open her skull. I didn't have any idea what this thing looked like. She described it as an electric toothbrush, which I thought was ridiculous. I had to send off for a picture of this saw to Fort Worth, Texas to confirm whether or not what she said it looked like actually was accurate. And I was astounded when I saw the picture. It indeed does resemble an electric toothbrush. I, I don't think that the observations she made uh, were based on what she experienced as she went into the operating room theater. They, they were just not available to her. For example, the drill and so on, those things are all covered up. They're not visible. They were inside their packages. You really don't begin to open until the patient is completely asleep so that you maintain a sterile environment. She also heard a, a conversation during the operation between Dr. Spessler and the cardiovascular surgeons who were cutting into her legs to hook her up to the uh, uh, heart-lung machine. Uh, when the cardiac surgeon incised her right groin, she found that her veins and arteries were too small and she had to go over to the left side and there was some conversation at the time between the doctors. Pam accurately recalled hearing that conversation. At that stage in the operation, nobody can observe here in that state. And I find it inconceivable that your normal senses, such as hearing, let alone the fact that she had clicking modules in each ear, that there was any way for her to hear those through normal auditory pathways. So again, this is very suggestive of the fact that there was some sort of extrasensory perception or out-of-body experience or whatever uh, occurring at the time that was allowing Pam to hear accurately and uh, seemingly see accurately what was going on in the operating room at the time. I felt a presence. I sort of turned around to look at it. And that's when I saw the very tiny pinpoint of light and the light started to pull me and there was a physical sensation to the pulling and I know how that must sound nonetheless it's true there was a physical sensation rather like going over a hill real fast tell me and I uh, went toward the light the closer I got to the light, I began to discern different figures, different people, and I distinctly heard my grandmother call me. She has a very distinct voice. And I immediately went to her. And it felt great. And I saw an uncle who passed away when he was only 39 years old. He taught me a lot. He taught me to place my first guitar. And I saw many, many people I knew and many, many I didn't know. But I knew that I was somehow in some way connected to them. I asked if God was the light. And the answer was no. God is not the light. The light is what happens when God breathes. And I distinctly remember thinking, I'm standing in the breath of God. At some point in time, I was reminded that it was time to go back. Of course, I had made my decision to go back before I ever laid down on that table. But, you know, the more I was there, the better I liked it. <laughs> and my uncle was the one who brought me back down to the body. But then I got to where the body was, and I looked at the thing, and I for sure did not want to get in it, because it looked pretty much like what it was, as in void of life. And I knew it would hurt, so I didn't want to get in. And he kept reasoning with me. He says, it's like diving into a swimming pool, just jump in. 
No. <laughs> what about the children? You know what? I think the children will be fine. <laughs> Honey, you've got to go. No. <laughs> he pushed me. He gave me a little help there. It's taken a long time, but I think I'm ready to forgive him for that. <laughs> but I landed. I saw the body jump. I saw it do this number. And then he pushed me, and I felt it do this number. This is a classic near-death experience occurring under extremely monitored medical conditions where every known vital sign and basically every clinical sign of life and death was being monitored at the time. And that's what makes her, her uh, case so remarkable and so valuable to us. I, I don't have an explanation for it. I don't know how it's possible for it to happen considering the physiological state she's in. At the same time, I have seen so many things that I can't explain that I don't want to be so arrogant as to be able to say uh, that there's no way it can happen. Pam's case points to the fact that somehow she was able to retain coherent perception and memory whilst clinically dead. This suggests the possibility of some kind of mind-brain separation. When the heart is stopped and the brain is not functioning, it really is not functioning. There can be no memory. It can't be remembering experiences in some way which are occurring at that time because the memory circuits don't work. So when the near-death experiencer talks about these memories of going out of their body and seeing the resuscitation process, it's difficult for our current neuroscience to understand how this could happen in using a memory system which is defined. And so one has to argue that in some way the information is retained outside the brain and then later on is fixed in memory circuits. Or you have to argue that it somehow or other occurs in the brain and goes into memory in a way we don't understand. Scientists agree that they have yet to discover what the mind is and how the brain produces consciousness. What makes us us has always been a mystery. The question is one of the oldest, most formidable and exciting challenges that science has yet to solve. In the middle of the Arizona desert, there is a scientist who is trying to come up with the answers to unravel just what the mind is and explain how consciousness occurs. Professor Stuart Hameroff is an anesthetist and the director of consciousness studies at the University of Arizona, Tucson. You feel nice and relaxed? Yeah. Okay. Showtime. Professor Hameroff has been working with British physicist Sir Roger Penrose in developing a theory about consciousness which might bring us closer to an understanding of how and when near-death experiences happen. When a patient is anesthetized, they are completely unconscious. They feel no pain, they have no awareness, and no memory. Unlike sleep, there's no dreaming, and if someone takes a knife to them, they don't feel it. So it's different than sleep. The brain is still active, there's electrical activity, but it's kind of like a motor idling, the clutch is in. The brain is telling the lungs to breathe, the brain is telling the heart to work, the brain is doing all kinds of things, but the thing that's missing is consciousness. So it's a good way of actually separating, isolating consciousness from other brain functions, which is why understanding anesthesia is a big clue to understanding consciousness. Professor Hameroff has been studying microscopically small structures known as microtubules that are deep inside the cells that form the brain. It is at this microscopic level that he believes that the brain produces the mind. The inside of cells include